Hello YouTube! Um, today I'm going to be talking about a concept that you probably thought you already knew a lot about. I'm going to be talking about the center. I'm going to be talking about the middle of the board, but really what I want to do is I want to give you a master level understanding of what the center of the board really is in chess. Like what it means and what it really is beyond the beginner level. Okay, so before we get started, if you like this kind of content and you want to see more, um, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Um, thank you very much. So the center of the board, um, usually defined to beginners as just simply these 16 squares, right? This four by four section of the board, right? So we kind of define the center for beginners as basically any square where a knight would control eight squares. So from here, this knight can control eight squares right? So that's the center of the board. So when we teach beginners, we just kind of give them a beginner understanding of chess. We say, okay, move your pieces to this area, move it to the center. And we're just sort of like, well, you know what, if, if, if Black were a really nice guy, and he just moved his knight back and forth, we would do something like this. And we would just put all of our pieces um, in the middle of the board. And we would just develop something like this, and we would get castled. And we tell people, this is what your goal is. This is your ideal position. This is what chess is all about. You just plant your pieces right here in the middle. Um, you just put every single one of these pieces on one of these uh, 16 squares, mission accomplished. And we tell them this, um, you know, to try to get them to at least start thinking about the center and start moving their pieces towards the center. But of course, in real chess, this isn't remotely the whole picture of, of what the center of the board really is. Okay, these 16 squares, that's not what the center of the board really is. Okay, so for starters, you have to understand that not every square in the center of the board is created equal. And you also have to understand that the center of the board is only important because of how our pieces move in chess and what our pieces do. And then there's a secondary reason for why the center of the board is important. And that's because of its strategic location. Okay, so one of the key concepts for the middle of the board is it's a pathway for anything to get from one side of the board to the other. In order for anything to get from where I'm at right now to, say, attack the king, which is kind of the goal of the game is we're trying to attack the king. For the most part, it's all going to have to go through the middle. Okay, and if you control the center, it, no matter where their king goes, you can shift their attack towards their king, right? So if their king is on the queen side, you can shift their attack to the queen side. If their king is on the king side, you can shift your attack to the king side. So once you control the center, you control absolutely everything on the board. So it's a strategic location. So even if none of the pieces gained anything particular by being in the middle of the board, it would still be a desirable location. It's like being on a hill in a battle. You can see everything all the way around you. That center of the board is like the hill in the middle of the board. Okay, so another thing to consider is that not all of the pieces treat the center of the board equally. And not all parts of the center are equal, even just from a basic statistical perspective. Okay, so we take a look at the knight, for example, and we tell people, okay, a knight controls eight squares on any of these 16 squares, right? Well, I want to give you a deeper way to look at this, because that's true, but it's also misleading, right? Because, yeah, I control eight squares, but chess isn't a game that's completely static, where I put my knight on f3 and that knight's just going to stay on f3 forever and ever and ever and always control eight squares. We don't go knight f3 and then declare victory and say mission accomplished. I have my knight on f3 now. The game is basically over, right? No, we're going to have to make more moves, especially since, like I said before, his king is over there. So if we're ever going to get checkmate or ever going to move towards something, we're going to have to move this knight again. So that comes back to one of my favorite quotes by Capablanca. Chess is not played in single moves. Chess is played in series of moves that we refer to as plants, right? So the knight is going to have to move to some place. Now, right now, the knight has eight options of where to move, all of these highlighted squares, right? He can move to eight different places. But not all of these places as, are as desirable as others, right? Now, if he moves into the middle of the board, like, say, here, right? Or here, okay? Those two places are pretty desirable. If he moves to either e5 or d4, he's going to be controlling eight squares from those locations. But other locations are not as desirable. 
if he moves back to g1 or to h2, he's only going to be controlling three squares from those locations, right? And I know what you're saying is, well, then he just shouldn't move backwards, right? But the point is, he's got eight options available to him, but only some of those options are really good options, right? But if I take that same knight, like let's say he plays knight f6, and then I play knight e5, and I put that knight in the middle of the board, right? I have eight options, but a lot more of those options are extremely desirable, right? Now, to give you an idea of the mathematics of this, okay? So if I just break this down into very basic mathematics, okay? So to give you an idea of the mathematics of this, if I break this board down into sets, right? So I can break this board down into slightly different sets of squares where the knight does better and the knight does worse. So from the center set of squares, the knight controls eight squares. But the squares that he can move to, okay, collectively control 56 squares, right? So in any combination of two moves, if I put that knight in one of these four squares in the middle, I can move to potentially 56 squares. That's like almost the whole board. I mean, it's a lot. The board's only 64 squares, right? So in any two move combination, I could hit 64 squares on the chessboard. That's the concept of the middle. The strategic concept of the middle is from the center, you can get almost anywhere, right? 56 possible locations that you can go to with the knight starting on e5 in a combination of two moves. Now, if I go to a slightly less desirable set of squares, right? Only slightly less desirable, still very desirable. We can go to this set of squares, right? So any of these squares right here in the middle, and the knight has the potential to go to 48 different locations on the board. Still really good, still a lot, still in the middle, still just about anywhere on that chessboard. It's about, you know, like two-thirds of the chessboard, close to two-thirds of the chessboard, maybe more like three-quarters. Um, it's a lot. The knight can go to a lot of places, but certainly less than if the knight were in the absolute center in that sweet center right? So then finally you have the squares, these corner squares that beginners love to put their knights on because they just move out there so easily. And then all of a sudden the knight controls eight squares. Well, from there, the knight can only go to 42 different locations on the chessboard in a combination of two moves. So when we look at the center of the board, we have to separate it into parts, right? Because not every single part of the middle of this board is equal. We have three different sets of central squares. We have the corner squares, then we have this set of squares, right, which is completely different from the corner squares. And then, of course, we have the sweet center. Okay, so if we break it down into those three sets of squares, right, we break it down into those three sets of squares, we have a much better understanding of what the center of the board really is. Okay, so let's take a look at like a typical game and let's take a look at um, a game that I think kind of exemplifies what I think the idea of the center is and what I think the idea of the center is like at the master and at the grandmaster level. Okay, so remember, keeping in mind that it's not just about where our knight is, right, or where our bishop is, like is it located in the middle? It's also about where our bishop can go right, or where our knight can go in a combination of moves. And it's also about that strategic idea in the middle of the board. Can we transfer our pieces cleanly from one side of the board to the other, right? So I'm going to show you a pretty famous game. This was actually a game played between Nimzovich and Capablanca. And Nimzovich was so convinced that Capablanca had simply made a mistake and dropped this pawn on a7 that he basically declared that that, that that Campoblanca was, I guess, that he didn't understand strategy, that he didn't understand chess. So Campoblanca played bishop g7, castle's kingside was played, castle's kingside was played. Okay, so we have a lot of problems here as black, or at least it looks like on the surface. We have a pawn down, right? We just lost our pawn, okay? And from the traditional sense of the center, from like the beginner sense of the center, it looks like white has a much better center. He's got a pawn in the middle of the board, and he has more space. His, his pieces are taking up a little bit more space. So from a very traditional sense, it appears that, that white has a better center. But let's think about this. Let's think about the center in a very real way. 
right? What is the center? The center is a concept. We're trying to get our pieces from one side of the board to the other, right? We're trying to get our pieces from point A to point B, and we have to transition through the middle of the board to do that. So one thing that Capablanca's got going for him in this position is he has a fianchetto, right? And we talked about the knights in the middle of the board, and we talked about how they prefer some squares to others, right? Like they prefer to be on those central squares like e5 or whatever. That's great, but bishops love long diagonals, right? If a bishop gets on the long diagonal and it cuts through here, and it's cutting all the way across to the other end of the board, we're going to have no problem going through that strategic location of the center of the board because we have a firm control of at least one diagonal that goes all the way from one side of the board to the other. And that's why bishops love long diagonals, right? Now, a bishop in a combination of two moves, unlike the knight, the bishop in a combination of two moves from pretty much any place on the board, in theory, if the board was empty, could get to any other square on the board that the bishop could conceivably move to. So it's going to control half the squares no matter what. So because of that, bishops just want to be on the longest diagonal they can get to. So the two ideal diagonals are usually these two big long ones. That's what the bishop wants to be on because it cuts straight through the sweet center and allows the transfer of our pieces from one side of the board to the other, right? And then as you just kind of move off of that center line, those diagonals are still desirable, but they become slightly less and less desirable as you move slightly off the center line, right? And it's all just about being able to transfer those pieces from one side of the board to the other. Okay, so I'll go ahead one move here. So queen a6 was played. So one of the ideas that Capablanca had here was that eventually he would be able to pressure this queen side. And eventually he would be able to post his knight someplace happy in the middle of the board, like maybe a better square, like maybe here or here, right? And he's going to be able to put pressure on the queen side, and because of this he's going to be able to win material. But stop and think about this in terms of the middle. What happy square does this knight really have available to it in the middle of the board? What long diagonal does this bishop really have? available to it in the middle of the board. What open files do these rooks have available to them to go to to improve their position? So even though from a traditional beginner sense of the center of the board, white's doing better, white has more space, white is the one with that pawn in the middle of the board, from our master perspective of the center of the board, black is actually doing quite a bit better. His pieces are able to transfer from one side of the board to the other. He has better posts for his knight that are secure in the middle of the board in the future. His bishop has the long diagonal, which allows him strategic control from the king side to the queen side. Right? So from our master perspective of what the center is, what the center does, the strategic location, the ability to improve the position of our pieces like our knights, to get them to those more ideal squares in the middle of the board, like the sweet center, or the c5 square, or the c4 square. Black is actually doing better, and that's why Capablanca has compensation for this pawn. Not to say that the pawn isn't worth something, it certainly is. It's a pawn, right? But he clearly has some compensation for it in terms of his better control of the middle of the board and his better control of these two open files, and just the fact that all of his pieces on the king side are going to be able to help with this attack on the queen side is proof that he must have control of the center of the board, because that's the, really the only way to get from one side of the board to the other, is through the middle, right? So you can watch the rest of this game. He just positions his rook in the middle of the board, makes Nimzovich defend, and he positions his queen in the center of the board, and he's preparing now to transfer his knight to one of these better squares while opening up his bishop. This is beautiful central play um, by an absolute classicist by, by Capablanca, right? And he's actually probably going to transfer his knight here and then transfer it here just to get to super, super juicy squares in the middle of the board, and that's going to put some direct pressure on these pawns. And as you can see, he's using the center both to improve the position of his pieces in a traditional sense. This knight is going to a much nicer square than it was before. e5 is much nicer than f6. But then he's also going to use it in a strategic sense on the very next move. We're using our center to go from one side of the board to the other.
right? So even though white's got this traditional center, it's not doing very much. It's just static. It's just sitting there, right? Meanwhile, black's center is being utilized to create these threats from one side of the board to the other, right? And Nimzovich, his whole position fell apart relatively quickly. You know, it wasn't like he could save this, right? So he just keeps maneuvering towards the queen side. He keeps putting that pressure. He keeps piling it on. And already um, Black's position is, is nearly, um, nearly, it's nearly impossible to defend with white now. White's pieces are just statically defending this extra pawn. And they're not making any forward progress because they can't get out of the way of their own pawns. They can't break through with Black's nice control of all these squares. There's no forward movement with this knight to d5. There's nothing that White can really do to make progress in this position because he doesn't have that master level control of the center. He's got control of the center in a really beginner way, but he doesn't have that advanced control of the center that we need, that strategic control of the center, the ability to transfer our pieces from one side of the board to the other, the ability to improve the position of our pieces like our knights from one part of the center to another part of the center that's more valuable. He doesn't have that, right? And because of this, the game falls apart really quickly. He plays queen e3, which is a mistake, but his position was already in deep trouble. And then he is able to capitalize on his positional advantage, and he turns it into a material advantage. His position gets so strong, Nimzovich has to start sacrificing material. And then Capablanca just starts winning material. And he uses his good technique and still great control of the center. Notice he's transferring his queen one side of the board to the other, one side of the board to the other. No problem, right? Puts his pawn in the middle of the board. Now he has a traditional center, right? And he's up in exchange. At this point, the game is pretty much over. And Nimzovich finally resigns after knight d1, yeah, owing to the fact that the rest of his material is about to be gone. You just saw how quickly this whole position just fell apart for white. And a lot of that had to do with the center, right? And it had to do with maybe a lack of understanding of the center of the board back in those times and a lack of understanding of what the center really was. So again, to summarize, the center of the board, it's more than just a place where your knight controls eight squares, right? It's a strategic idea. It's a way for you to get your pieces from one side of the board to the other. And also, not all 16 of those squares in the center of the board are created equal. Some of those squares, like for pieces like knights, are worth more than others, right? And of course, some of these diagonals that cut through the center of the board are worth more than others. The long diagonals are, of course, more valuable than the shorter diagonals, right? So that's the center of the board. That's a master level understanding of the center of the board not just what we teach beginners just throw your pieces in the middle and you should be okay okay i hope you found this video helpful and i hope you learned something new about chess thank you very much for watching thank you very much for watching my chess content if you want to see more please subscribe to my channel um it'll help me bring more content than the buttons it's right push push the button it's subscribe that's what it says please subscribe